Red Opera is rightly regarded by those familiar with his work, including me, as one of the pioneers of American newspaper comic strips, and he was featured briefly in the Art of the Cartoon series. But with hindsight, I don't think that's enough exposure for an artist of such importance, so here's another look in greater detail. He was born in Madison, Ohio in 1857, and at the age of only 14, he dropped out of school to work as a printer's apprentice at the Madison Gazette. In 1873, when he was 16 years old, he moved to New York, where he studied art briefly at the Cooper Union. He followed this with an equally brief period as assistant to the successful illustrator Frank Beard, no relation. A couple of years later, Opper started getting work published in a handful of magazines, and in 1877, he took a job as a staff artist at the magazine Leslie's Weekly. In 1880, he was offered a role more suited to his talents at the humour magazine Puck, and he stayed with them for the next 18 years, drawing everything from spot illustrations to chromolithograph colour covers and double-page spreads. During his later years at Puck, Opper began to explore a more economical and deliberately scratchy pen technique, and by 1899, when he left Puck to work for the New York Journal, this had become his recognised stylistic approach. His comic strip Happy Hooligan first appeared in the journal in 1900, and it ran successfully for more than 30 years. The strip was created in pen and ink and appeared as monochrome in some papers, but a watercoloured version, not necessarily by Opper himself, also featured in some newspaper colour supplements. He used this success as a springboard for other comic strip ideas, which included the two Frenchmen Alphonse and Gaston, and a prehistorically themed strip titled Our Antediluvian Ancestors. But it was the appearance of his comic strip and her name was Maud in 1904, which really captured the public's imagination. This was a tale of a cantankerous mule, who was fond of kicking anyone who annoyed her and got too near. And this most basic of narratives was particularly successful and was widely syndicated for three decades. The syndication of Opera's work wasn't just confined to the United States and during his lifetime he was published in European newspapers too. And he was still writing and drawing both Maud and Happy Hooligan into his 70s and only stopped when his eyesight began to fail and he was forced to retire in 1934. He died three years later in New York at the age of 80, and he really should be better known. Harry B. Nielsen was born in Birkenhead in the northwest of England in 1861. He began working in 1879 as an engineer and electrician on seagoing ships. Then eight years later, in 1887, he left to join his brother as a plantation manager in India. But he had also been honing his skills as a writer and illustrator, and two years later, in 1889, his first book, the clumsily titled The Adventures of Sam Pippin's Esquire with the Kilkenny Hunt, was published. During the decade that followed, illustration grew to be his sole source of income, and by the end of the 19th century, he had become well established, with a well-earned reputation for anthropomorphic animals. In 1897, his illustration Mr Fox's Hunt Breakfast on Christmas Day was published as a free Christmas gift to readers of the Penny Illustrated paper. By this time he had returned to England, but resisted the pull of London to live in Bidston, a village close to his place of birth. During his career as a children's illustrator, he had a particularly strong working partnership with the writer Sam Heald Hamer. This was extremely good luck for Nielsen, as Hamer was also the editor at one of London's most prominent publishing houses. The first of these collaborations was Mickey McGee's Menagerie in 1897, and that was followed by Wise and Otherwise a year later. The success of these books seemed to signal a positive avalanche of work for Nielsen, and dozens more books were published over the next couple of decades. Some were self-authored, and some were by others, including Hamer, but all of them were successful. Virtually all his subjects were endearing anthropomorphic animals, created in pen and ink with watercolour washes. By now he was immensely popular and well known, 
and in addition to his books, he also illustrated magazines and designed postcards and Christmas cards with his usual cast of animal characters. In 1917, he returned to the hunting theme with his book The Fox's Frolic or A Day with the Topsy-Turvy Hunt, another in a long line of lengthy titles. Nielsen remained popular as both an illustrator and a writer for children in his later years. Unlike others who were starting to be seen as dated, his approach to character and relatively bold inking style were very much aligned with what illustrators in the rapidly expanding comics market were creating. Nielsen's last published children's book was 1930's Mr Skiddlywinks, written by Edith Millard. Not long after he retired and spent his final years in Bidston, up to his death in 1941 when he was 80 years old. There is quite a lot written about Czechoslovakian František Kupka, but unfortunately most of it focuses on his career as an artist. He was just as successful as an illustrator, and it's rather annoying that this doesn't get anything like the same attention. He was born in 1871 in the region known as Bohemia, which was then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. His family were poor, and he left school to start working at the age of only 13. And by the time he reached 16, he was travelling around Bohemia working as a sign painter. With the money he'd earned, he enrolled at the Academy of Fine Arts in Prague in 1889, and in 1892, he followed that up with more study in Vienna. At this time, his ambition was to be an artist, and he painted with an expressionistic but largely representational style. And although he achieved reasonable success with his painting, it wasn't enough to live on. In 1897, he left Vienna and set out for Paris, where he believed he would stand more chance of success. And like his countryman and contemporary Alphonse Mucha, Kupka found it much easier to make a good living with illustration. And so his art career was temporarily put on hold while he became established as an illustrator and started to make considerably more money than his painting had generated. He achieved success early on and into the years that followed with a series of scathing satirical drawings for the Parisian humour magazine La Ciette au Beurre. The images he created were most frequently drawn straight onto lithographic stone. This was a popular method among his contemporaries because it allowed for a wide range of textures and linear techniques using brush or crayon, and frequently both. And once completed, the artwork was print-ready, making it very popular with newspapers and magazines. In 1904, he illustrated the final volume of La Nouvelle Géographie Universelle, written by Elysée Reclus. And in the same year, his illustrated edition of the Old Testament Song of Songs was also published, with a set of exceptionally detailed Art Nouveau-styled engravings. In 1908, his breathtaking dramatic illustrations for Le Comte de Lille's story Les Ereignies were published, and this was a significant triumph, both creatively and materially. The series demonstrated his mastery of the medium of watercolour, which he applied energetically, giving all these complex narrative illustrations a spontaneous and stimulating appeal. By 1910, his work as an artist had distanced itself from his earlier, more representational work and had evolved into increasing levels of abstraction. This proved more successful than his earlier attempts as an artist, and in the years that followed, Cook had devoted increasing amounts of his time to his art, while his illustration work was correspondingly sidelined. By 1918, he had become the successful artist he had always wanted to be, he even had a rich industrialist patron who bought most of his work, and he no longer needed to compromise himself with commercial work. I doubt I'm the only one who thinks that's a great pity, giving the illustration over the painting every time. And he never did return to illustration, but carried on painting up to his death in 1957 at the age of 86. French illustrator Georges Le Pape was a significant figure in the Art Deco movement, but very few know of his existence. He was born in 1887 in Paris, and between 1908 and 1910 he studied art at the École des Beaux-Arts. 
While still a student, he exhibited some paintings in 1909, and there he met the massively successful clothes designer Paul Poiret. They quickly became friends and business associates, and in 1911, Poiret published a lavish brochure of his designs with illustrations by Le Pape. This was a great popular and critical success, and a year later he produced an equally successful brochure for rival designer Jean Patou. At this time, the influential fashion magazine Le Gazette du Bon Temps began publication, and the favourable attention Le Pape had been getting convinced them to feature his work in the first edition. He was regularly commissioned by them from this point onward. These illustrations were reproduced as pochoir prints, which was a particularly labour-intensive process, with individual colours applied using stencils by a team of colourists. The process did produce extremely vivid colours, but was simply not viable for magazines with bigger circulations. In 1916, Vogue commissioned him to illustrate the first cover of their British edition, and this quickly led to publication in the American Vogue too. And in the years that followed, his modernist but sensual images were published regularly on the covers of not just Vogue, but most of the major fashion and lifestyle magazines in Europe and America. The Pape didn't confine himself to fashion, and he also created posters and press ads, and occasional stage and costume design for theatrical productions. In 1926, he was invited to New York by Vogue's American publisher, and he spent six months there and created yet more striking designs for their covers, as well as working for other clients. His association with fashion also led some in the world of advertising to the conclusion that their ads would benefit from his light, sophisticated touch. Throughout the later 1920s and into the 1930s, Le Pape remained at the forefront of his profession on an international basis. But as early as 1930, a less obviously Art Deco style and technique began to appear in some of his magazine work. And in 1937, his edition of the complete works of Alfred de Musset was published. And although the images still utilised some formal elements typical of Art Deco, they were clearly more organic and featured far more expressive tonal application of watercolour. In 1941, his illustrations for the Satyricon by Petronius were published and confirmed that Le Pape was now more interested in the possibilities of narrative illustration and he followed that up with a similar treatment for the centenary edition of Stendhal's book The Abbess de Castro in 1942. By the time the war had ended in 1945, he was firmly established as a book illustrator, and that's how he remained up to retirement a few years later. He went to live in the picturesque rural location of Bonneval, south of Paris, and he died there in 1971 at the age of 84 which wraps up this instalment and I hope I'll see you for the next.